important thing to keep in mind is that France in the 18th century actually had a 1% population problem too. That is, 1% um, of the population uh, was comprised of members of the clergy and the nobility, the aristocracy, and 99% of the population, which was approximately 28 million people in 1789, that the rest of them made up this thing called the third estate, which included everyone from financiers, lawyers, doctors, to artisans, urban laborers, and majority peasants. The main thing to understand is that the first two groups I mentioned, the clergy and the nobility, the 1%, basically paid no taxes. It was a privilege that they had given their birth and their position, but they didn't pay taxes. So the wealthiest members of this society could not be taxed as a source of revenue. And that's where this crisis um, is going to emerge uh, for the monarchy. So it's a society that's grounded in the principle of difference and inequality before the law. This concept of society and this justification for inequality comes under attack in the 18th century, uh, spearheaded by this progressive intellectual movement known as the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment is an international movement. Philadelphia is an important center of the Enlightenment, and so is Moscow, and so is Edinburgh. Uh, and Paris was a very important center of the Enlightenment. So, um, oh, I'd like the next slide, please. Forgot about that. I just wanted, back to my previous point, this image, which was produced during the French Revolution, but I think illustrates the social hierarchy of the old regime. You see a bent over peasant carrying a member of the clergy and an aristocrat on his back. Right? And so this gives you this sense of oppression, resentment, uh, and uh, literally his labor supports uh, their lifestyle. So the Enlightenment, um, these reformers, they believed in progress. They embraced a, a scientific worldview. They believed in human capacity for reason. And they wanted to direct that reason to improve society and eliminate abuses. And they called for religious toleration, legal equality, freedom of expression. All of the women in tonight's opera were raised in the sort of spirit of the Enlightenment. And they're reading these authors and talking about these ideas. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So, Olympe de Gouge, uh, who's one of our, our characters, uh, had a very active career as a playwright before 1789, and she would go on to write a lot of political pamphlets, as we'll see, during the Revolution. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? But I just, I wanted to show you one of her early plays that was successful, uh, that was called On Black Slavery or the Happy Shipwreck. Uh, this play, as you can tell from the title, Olympe de Gouge was not only involved in what we would call feminist causes, but she was also moving in abolitionist circles to uh, outlaw slavery in the French colonies most important colony for France in the 18th century was what would become Haiti. It was called Saint-Domingue in the 18th century. So um, many of these women participated in what were called salons, or they ran salons. And salons were uh, weekly meetings in private households for intellectual 
intellectuals, philosophers, artists, the curious, uh, to meet and read things and talk about them. And they're real hubs of enlightenment. But I think the important thing here is the role that women played in running these salons and sort of hosting them. Uh, and both Madame de Stahl and Madame Roland, two of your figures in the opera tonight, were raised as young girls attending these salons and meeting super luminary figures like Voltaire and Montesquieu or like Ben Franklin when he went to Paris. And, and so they're reading this stuff and they're, they're highly engaged with it. May I have the next slide, please? One other, one, another one of our, our um, protagonists tonight, uh, Elisabeth Vigée Lebrun, I just wanted to emphasize, uh, was a celebrated female artist prior to the revolution. And this is a self-portrait of her. She was one of four women elected to the prestigious Royal Academy of Painting. And she was also the official portrait painter of Marie Antoinette. May I have the next slide, please? Marie Antoinette was the queen of France. She came from Austria, which, as we'll see, was a big problem during the revolution. She's the wife of Louis XVI. And I just wanted to show you these two paintings from 1783 by Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun of the Queen of France, Marie Antoinette, because they, this, these two, the first painting on the left provoked a scandal, and it had to be taken down and replaced by the one on the right. Now, it doesn't look very scandalous to us, but for French viewers who went to see this portrait, they felt that the Queen looked like she was wearing her underwear or a nightgown, uh, that she didn't look formal enough, she didn't look like a queen. And so, as I say, the, the portrait had to be taken down and replaced. But again, I'm just trying to show you that uh, Vigée Lebrun, uh, working with Marie Antoinette, they're both elite women, but they're also sort of reaching for some new ideas about femininity, lack of formality, more comfortable clothing, being close to nature. These are all sort of new, new ideas that are emerging in this period. Um, so, okay, the only other thing I want to say is that on the other side of, well, coming out of the Enlightenment, one of the most important thinkers in terms of gender and women was Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And Rousseau's ideas were that women uh, should dedicate themselves to the home and to childbearing. That that was their natural destination, natural duty. He valorized these activities. He thought they were very important. But he, he denounced women who were independent, educated professionals. Uh, he thought that that led to a sort of unnatural set of role relations and that it would be better to keep men and women in what we would call separate spheres. I just mention this because Rousseau's ideas proved very influential during the French Revolution to the Jacobin regime. Uh, next slide, please. So, the opening act. Oh, and I'm sorry, the last one was, I just wanted to show you this. This is Lavoisier, the chemist, with his wife, Pierrette, who's your other um, protagonist tonight. Just wanted you to see this joint portrait of them as both a mar affectionate married couple and partners in this scientific endeavor. Okay, next slide. So, the revolution begins in May, June, 1789. And it is provoked by a fiscal crisis. The, the crown can't pay its debts. And it can't raise taxes on its wealthiest um, citizen subjects because they have privileges that prevent them from paying taxes. So it summons this large representative body 
with representatives of the, the various social groups to meet at Versailles to try to work out a compromise. But very quickly it becomes clear that the clergy and the nobility are not going to agree to any taxes. So at that point, the members of the Third Estate um, decide to form a new body that they call the National Assembly. And they invite members of the clergy and the nobility to join them. And they say that their purpose is going to be to give France a new constitution. And they take an oath to do this, and that's this image that you're seeing here. Uh, it's called the Tennis Court Oath. Next slide, please. So then the revolution really kicks off. If you know perhaps anything about the French Revolution, it's the storming of the Bastille, July 14, 1789. After the events that happened out at Versailles, people are starting to agitate. The king is sending soldiers into Paris because he's nervous about particularly the working classes and re re possible revolts. And people panic and they, Parisians start looking for gunpowder they, and they end up attacking this fortress, which was a prison, because it had a lot of gunpowder in it. And the fortress stood in the eastern parts of Paris in a kind of working class neighborhood. But the main thing about the Bastille is that it's a powerful symbol of despotic royal authority because it's a prison where the monarchy would lock up critics and opponents. It has a lot of symbolic force. At the time it was attacked, there were only seven prisoners in it, but people felt very strongly about it, okay? So they charge the Bastille, they get some members of the, the National Guard with cannon to blow holes through the walls, and then they gradually dismantle this medieval fortress prison stone by stone. This event said reverberations around France and around the world. It was seen as something that people couldn't believe would ever happen. It marked the triumph of little people, ordinary people, over tyranny. Next slide, please. A few months later, this is where you see a, a, an incident that really directly involves women. Um, in October, the price of bread is spiraling out of control and famine is looming on the horizon. So a bunch of women gather waiting in line to try to purchase limited quantities of grain in the marketplace decide that they need to go out to Versailles and ask the king to lower the price of bread and get them some bread to feed their children. And so they gather some pikes and muskets and pitchforks and they drag some soldiers along with them and they march for hours in pouring rain west of Paris out to Versailles where they summon the king and the queen to the balcony of the palace and they demand that they return to Paris with them. And so the king, the queen, and their children are escorted by this crowd of angry women and some soldiers back to Paris. And that's the last time that they, the monarchy saw uh, Versailles. But again, this is an important incident in showing us the way in which the revolution is often moved forward by popular movements, popular threat of popular violence. Next slide, please. So now we're in the liberal phase of the revolution from 1789 to 1792. And um, this phase of the revolution is characterized above all by dismantling the old regime, abolishing privileges, feudalism, establishing the principle of equality before the law. And this is kind of, that, um, we, we, this document on the left, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, codifies in 17 articles a kind of Bill of Rights for
for the French Revolution. And the reforms reflected a lot of the ideas of the Enlightenment, guarantees freedom of religion, freedom of expression, no taxation without representation, due legal process. I've put on the right of this slide, Alain de Gouges, a few, two years later, rewrites the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen and calls it the Declaration of the Rights of Women and Citizenesses. May I have the next slide, please? And I've just put up a few of her quotations here because people often don't realize how, I don't know, how radical it actually was for the time. The first sentence, woman is born free and remains equal to man and rights, um, I think kind of summarizes uh, and she says, what advantages have you gathered from the revolution? Whatever the barriers set up against you, it is in your power to overcome them. You only have to want it. Okay, so the revolution then is going to get propelled in this more radical direction by a couple of events. May I have the next slide, please? The first of these, in June 1791, the royal family attempts to flee Paris in disguise, not a very good disguise. They're heading east to meet up with uh, loyal troops across the border, but they're recognized by a postmaster in the town of Varennes. They're arrested and they're brought back to Paris. The bad thing about this botched flight was that Louis XVI left some documents behind, assuming he'd be out of the country, in which he said that um, he didn't support the revolution and he wanted to reestablish his full authority. So from this point on, we start to see the split between the two main groups, the Jacobins and the Girondins, in terms of politics. The Jacobins begin calling for the end of the monarchy, saying it couldn't be trusted. The Girondins are more moderate, and they're trying to create a constitutional monarchy. Um, this liberal sort of phase ends on August 10th, 1792, when angry uh, Parisians basically storm the palace in Paris where the monarchy is living and calls for the end of the monarchy and the king and his family is placed under arrest. And then we have the next um, slide, please. Finally, because this is referred to in your opera, a few weeks after the arrest of the monarchy, this pretty gruesome event called the September Massacres occur. Uh, France is at war by this time with Austria and Prussia, and there's a fear of an invasion. And so Parisian militants run around the city and go visit all the prisons and demand the jailers bring the prisoners out. They set up these mock trials and they slaughter these prisoners. Most of the people in prison were not criminals or counter-revolutionaries. They were basically people who, under the old regime, had been nobles or priests or just by who they were. The government at the time doesn't do anything to intervene or to condemn the September massacres. And that, again, is something that the women in the opera you're going to see feel very strongly that that, that was going too far to condone this kind of, it seemed like senseless violence. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So now we're, we have the king under arrest and the next big challenge is trying to figure out what to do with the king. The king is put on trial and again, his trial ends up um, what do I want to say? His trial ends up uh, tarnishing the Girondins and promoting the Jacobins, propelling them into power. The Girondins want to punish the king, but they don't want to kill him. They actually think about 
sending the royal family off in exile to Louisiana, which I always think would be like a great story, fic historical fiction or opera. Like, what if they had ended up in New Orleans and would our whole country like be more French than English? I don't know. But that plan didn't go anywhere. The Jacobins prevailed as um, Saint-Just famously said, no man can reign innocently. And Robespierre, Louis must die, for the nation must live. And this sealed the fate of the king who was executed on January 21st, 1793. So you have an image here, the guillotine and the executioner showing his head to the people. Following the um, trial of the king, there's a purging of the Girondins. A bunch of them are arrested, imprisoned. Others are sent, forced to leave Paris. And this is also when Madame Roland, who's associated as one of the leaders of the Girondins and a gathering place for them, she gets arrested at this time too. Uh, next slide, please. This is also the moment when Charlotte Corday arrives on the historical scene. Uh, she's also a Girondin sympathizer, very upset by the violence and the bloodshed. And she claims she has a petition, etc. She stabs one of the leading Jacobins, Maha, in his bathtub. You might say, why does this guy conduct business from a bathtub? Uh, he actually did because he had a skin condition and he had to soak in these baths and he, people would have appointments with him in the bathtub. But it, it does create a very dramatic image of her stabbing him in the bathtub. Um, Mara was very closely associated with the, the violent masses. He had a newspaper he published called Friend of the People, and he was constantly calling for more violence and more surveillance. Charlotte Colday thought she was saving the Republic by killing Mara. He became a martyr for the revolution. Interestingly, Charlotte Colday over time will become a martyr for the counter-revolution or efforts to, you know, turn back the terror. Um, all right, so now we are in the period of the terror, and this is the moment, the fall of 1793, where our opera takes place, and there's a national draft in place, France has been declared a, under a state of emergency. There's a revolutionary dictatorship set up that's gonna last for the next 10 months. And the decree is that we will govern by terror. So this establishes a culture of surveillance and denunciation, fears that there are enemies everywhere. Um, this is also a period, fall of 93, when there's a crackdown on women's political activities. A law is passed that forbids women from joining political associations or from meeting with men or in any kind of forum to discuss politics or to be out on the streets protesting. Um, next slide, please. Under the Jacobins, there's a kind of definite uh, attack on public women, educated women, women who don't conform to the, the, the domestic vision that had been promoted by Rousseau. They're seen as undermining the morality of the Republic. The most visible symbol of this female decadence was Queen Marie Antoinette. And so she's been sitting around in prison since Louis XVI was executed and no one quite knew what to do with her. A lot of people were like, eh, ship her back to Austria. That's where she came from. But it's decided that she, her trial, she needs to be placed on trial too, to make a point. And her trial only lasts two days and she's executed on October 16th, and this is a sketch made by a very famous artist, 
Jacques-Louis David, who caught her as she was being taken on the tumbrel to the, to the guillotine out his apartment window, and he just, he just sketched her quickly there in profile. Just a um, few weeks after Marie Antoinette was executed, Olympe de Gouges was executed, and Mo Madame Roland was executed. So you can see there's this whole cluster of attacks on these kind of prominent women in this uh, period. So the next nine months, uh, we, be, we see an acceleration of terror and purgings and denunciations. But at the same time, by the late spring, summer of 94, the French armies are starting to win a lot of victories. And so the military pressure is backing off. And as the crisis atmosphere receded, members of the Committee of Public Safety decided that Robespierre was becoming a dictator, that he was dangerous to the revolution, and they managed to have him arrested along with his main supporters, and they bring about his trial and execution on July 27, 1794, and that's what we use as the date to, to, to demarcate the end of the terror. So after the terror, um, I think I have another slide. What do I have here? Yeah. Uh, after the terror, uh, we have a regime known as the Directory for four years. And it's a very difficult and traumatic period. But the basic goal of the Directory is to restore order and political stability and heal the wounds of the terror. The directory is dominated by wealthy and educated men and definitely cracks down on popular participation in all forms. Directory is not a very popular government, but it kind of holds the peace for four years. During the directory, an unknown general starts winning a series of brilliant victories. His name is Napoleon Bonaparte and he's soon being celebrated as a hero. And in 1799, he organizes a coup d'etat that topples the directory and brings himself to power. First he's consul, and then he becomes emperor. The only thing I want to mention about Napoleon, and then I'm going to stop talking, is that he puts in place in 1804 a new civil law code for France. And what's really interesting about this law code is that it has very harsh restrictions on women's rights, and it restores a patriarchal vision of the family. So husbands and fathers had legal control over their wives and children. Women could no longer publish books under their own name. That's why some women in the 19th century will adapt a man's name to be able to publish something. They couldn't, couldn't go appear in law courts without a husband or a father to represent them. And they could not initiate divorce. Divorce had been legalized during the French Revolution for both men and women. Now only men could start these processes. So I'm just suggesting that many historians feel that the Napoleonic Code seems to be a, a large step backwards um, in terms of women's equality and understanding of gender dynamics. Some would say, I would say, it seems like a step backward even compared to the Enlightenment <laughs> when we saw you know, these women being uh, very active, etc. All I would say is that in the short run, women took a step back coming out of the French Revolution, but I think that their legacy or this moment is important. It, it, cre it cre entered the collective memory for the 19th and 20th century, later generations of feminist activists. And, you know, women's rights in this period were linked to all these other rights that we still continue to talk about. Women's rights really emerged as a human rights issue. And I guess the fact that I'm standing here today giving you this talk, 
prior to an opera performed by an all-female-run opera company is a testament to the legacy of these women during the French Revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you.